What up, what up? It's Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies, and I have something different for you today. In this video, I'm doing my mock lottery. Now, the lottery hasn't been done yet, obviously, because the season is, is still in limbo, but the records and the standings and the draft order is based off of Tankathon and going by the worst records and, and going in that particular order. So I understand that this draft order that I'm drafting in today is going to be totally different once we actually have the NBA lottery, so bear with me. But like I said, we're going by the Tankathon standings. With all that said, these picks are just my opinion on what I would do if I were in charge of each particular team and based off the players that are available. So let's get started with my 2020 NBA Draft Mock Lottery. And the first pick goes to the Golden State Warriors. Now, if I'm Golden State, the player that I'm selecting, it may catch you by surprise. I'm going to select James Wiseman out of Memphis. I know that he did not have the year that everybody expected. He only played three games. And I understand that people are saying that you can't build around a center. Why would you take a center number one? But if I'm Golden State... I have the luxury of being able to select who I think might have the most talent. Um, the reason I didn't have any guards at this particular spot is because I feel like the guards that are high in the draft need the basketball in their hands to be productive. And I just don't think you'd have that opportunity with Golden State. You know, I have a window right here with, you know, Steph and Clay and Draymond and, and now Andrew Wiggins. And so what I would do is I would just select a center who doesn't necessarily need the ball, someone that I feel like has a lot of potential, and someone that can be groomed, has a high upside, and that there's not going to be any pressure on him to really perform and come out and have big numbers as a rookie. So that's why I would select James Wiseman. Um, I would also consider Onyeka Okongwu. I mean, there are people who feel like he may have a higher upside or he may be more of a safer pick than James Wiseman. I totally get that also. I don't know if I would select him number one. I just don't think that any of the guards that are available would be a good fit in the short term. And if I'm Golden State, I'm probably thinking more so short term than long term. And that's why I would take James Wiseman. Selecting number two in the 2020 NBA draft based off the Tankathon standings is the Cleveland Cavaliers. Cleveland is a tough team to select for simply because this is a guard-heavy draft. And Cleveland does not need another guard. They've drafted at least three guards in the last two drafts. Um, they just made a trade for Andre Drummond, even though they did not give up a lot for him. And with this pandemic going on and the way the financial situation is looking, it absolutely makes no sense for Andre Drummond to opt out. So if I were him, I'd opt back into Cleveland. They still have Kevin Love. They still have Tristan Thompson. Tristan Thompson. And we don't know if either one of them is in their long-term plans. And I just don't know the direction of the Cavs. But... I'm still selecting Killian Hayes number two if I'm Cleveland. This is probably a another shocker pick for you. Hayes is my number one point guard in the draft. I, I really, really like his upside. I think what separates him from Darius Garland is he's he's more of a playmaker. I think Garland is more of a scorer. I think Colin Sexton is more of a scorer. But I believe Killian Hayes combines both. He's a better passer than both of them. At 6'5", I think he can play alongside either one of those guards because he's bigger than those two. And I think that he may complement both of them. So you're probably wondering why I have Killian Hayes as my top point guard in the draft. I just am a believer in his upside. I think that he is probably the best if you combine passing and scoring. I think that he's going to be a high-level scorer. I think that he will be able to score on three levels in the NBA. His outside shooting right now on paper doesn't look good, but I'm buying stock into him as an outside shooter simply because he's a very good free throw shooter. He shot over 87% from the line, and I just, I just really love his game. I'm just high on him as a pick-and-roll playmaker, and I think that he is the best fit for Cleveland, and he allows the other guys to do what they do best, which is score. And in my opinion, the, the ball did not move very well in Cleveland. They really needed a playmaker that could get their players in the offense and score if needed. And so that's why Killian Hayes is my number two pick. All right, 
Now with the third pick, we have the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now Minnesota made a, a move at the deadline where they acquired D'Angelo Russell. They paired him with Carl Anthony Towns. And then Malik Beasley was also a very good fit for them. For Minnesota, I, I kind of struggle with who would I select that complements both guys. They have their cornerstones. I'm going to take Anthony Edwards. Um, young kid, he's only about 18. He has a lot of potential. You can arguably say he's the most talented player in the draft. There are some things that I, I believe that he needs to improve on. I thought about taking someone that's a better defender to complement Russell and, and Towns, but I just feel like at this point, Anthony Edwards is too good to pass up at number three. He wouldn't have to come in and average 20 points a game as a rookie. And I would much rather like that than to have him on a team where he's the number one option early because I think some of his his flaws will really be intensified or magnified if he goes to a bad situation where he is the number one option as a rookie. Number four, Atlanta Hawks. Again, this is going to be another pick that kind of makes people scratch their head. I believe Atlanta really, really needs a defender. I believe more than offense, they need defense. And I think Isaac Okoro is a guy that has the highest potential, in my opinion, as a defender in this draft. I think he could end up being an all-NBA defender. And I think he will make up for, you know, just some of the holes Atlanta had defensively. And then they have Clint Capella next year, so they should be a better defensive team. But I think he has the potential to, to defend up to four positions. Um, obviously, Trey Young is the star there, but Trey is one of the worst defenders in the NBA. So I think when it comes to finding a complimentary piece for Trey, I think you really need to find a plus defender. Atlanta has taken a few other wings with Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter last year. So, you know, you don't really know where they could go in this particular draft. Do they take another point guard? LaMelo Ball is still available. Do you pair him with Trey? You have two dynamic passers, but I think they both need the ball. John Collins, I mean, he may be in their long-term plans. Clint Capella, they just made a trade for him. He's young. So, in my opinion you would select another wing player, and Isaac Okoro is the player that I would select based off of his defensive potential. Next pick is pretty much a no-brainer. It's probably one of the easiest selections in the draft, and it's the Detroit Pistons at number five, and they are in desperate need of a point guard. Reggie Jackson was bought out. He went to the Clippers. Derrick Rose is, I mean, I just, I don't think he's in their long-term plans because if I'm Detroit, I'm looking to rebuild and just kind of start from scratch. LaMelo Ball would be the perfect fit here simply because he is the best point guard available and he's someone that could arguably be taken number one depending on how the lottery shakes out. But to have him available at number five, it's an easy choice for Detroit. He will bring excitement to the arena, to Detroit. I mean, I think he'll fill seats. He plays an exciting style of basketball. He is the best passer in the draft. And like I mentioned, I think Killian Hayes combines the best potential as a playmaker and a scorer. But LaMelo is, he's the best passer in the draft. I mean, there's there's not very many players that we've ever seen with his type of creativity and passing instincts and his feel for the game. And so I would love to see him and Blake Griffin become a an exciting pick and roll combination. So LaMelo Ball will be my choice at number five for the Detroit Pistons. Number six, the New York Knicks. And if you're New York, this is kind of, you know, deja vu. Um, you were hoping you could get LaMelo. You were hoping you could get maybe an Anthony Edwards or, or big time name. But the player that I think fits with them and that I would select is Denny Abdia. I, I really like Denny in, in this particular situation, I really think he can play point forward. I, I look at how he played in the under-20s where he got a chance to play point forward. And I think that he's a guy that can make their players better. I think that he needs to work on his shooting. And for whatever reasons, um, 
He's just a, a very, very poor free throw shooter. But his mechanics look solid. He shot a respectable percentage from three. But I definitely think that he can improve as a, a shooter. I think for New York, if you can get a point guard and free agency, and then he's a guy that you can put in at the three, and he becomes a secondary playmaker. Um, but he can run side pick and rolls, and he can just kind of make things easier for the other players on the court. Um, I've seen him being described as a connective tissue, and that's something I would agree with. Um, I like to use the word complementary a lot, but I think Avdia has a game that can complement any set of players on the floor. If you have a good point guard that's a scorer, he can allow him to play off the ball some. He can run side pick and rolls. Um, he can post up. I think that he's going to be a solid threat in the post because he can post smaller guards, and if he has a mismatch, he can make the right passes and find cutters. So that's why I think that he would be a good pick for the Knicks. Next up, Chicago Bulls. The Chicago Bulls are another team where it's difficult to predict which direction they'll go and to find the player that best fits their system. It's going to possibly be a new coach. You know, their front office has changed. But also their starting five seems pretty set. Just if I were a betting man, I would say that Kobe White would start at the one, Zach Levine at the two, Otto Porter at the three, Lloyd Marketing at the four, and Wendell Carter. And Kobe White is a guy that they selected last year in the lottery, and he had a tremendous second half to his season. I mean, the last few weeks before the season was canceled, Kobe White was one of the best players in the NBA. I think he was averaging over like 26 points per game over, you know, the last... I don't know, a few weeks or whatever. So I don't have those numbers off the top of my head. But you would imagine that he's someone that is going to have a prominent role in their future. Zach Levine is obviously their star player, their go-to player. Otto Porter is a solid role player. Louis Markkinen is a guy that I believe hasn't scratched the surface of his potential. He's had some injuries the last couple of years. But I definitely believe that we have not seen the best of him. Wendell Carter is a guy that I believe could possibly be an all-star one day. So when you look at their starting five, you're kind of wondering, like, which rookie fits in? So if I were the general manager of the Chicago Bulls, the player that I think fits along with this core group is Iowa State's Tyrese Halliburton. So you may say, why would you take Tyrese Halliburton when you just praised Kobe White 30 seconds ago? Well, in my opinion, Kobe White is a guy that he's going to get his buckets. He's going to think about himself first. And he is a phenomenal scorer. But I don't know if him and Zach Levine fit together well because they're both guys that are going to look for their shots first. And so I think Halliburton is a guy that can play alongside both of them. He may not start or, or they may decide to, you know, start with Halliburton at the point and bring Kobe White off the bench and let him be a microwave type scorer. But I believe that Halliburton can play with both of them. And I think in some lineups, he can also play with all of them. So I think you can possibly play Kobe White, Zach Levine, and Tyrese Halliburton on the floor at the same time, which will you know, kind of balance things out a little bit because Halliburton is more of a guy that is a setup guy. He passes the ball well. He can play off the ball because he's such a good shooter. There may be questions about the form of his shot, but he reminds me a little bit of Lonzo Ball as he is a guy that can complement a scoring point guard. He can play the one or the two. If there's a guy that is a primary ball handler that needs the ball in his hands, he can complement that player. So that's why I would select Tyrese Halliburton, number seven, if I were the Chicago Bulls. Number eight, maybe outside of Detroit, the easiest selection of the draft. And if I were the Charlotte Hornets and, you know, whatever pick I have comes up and I don't think it would take me more than 30 seconds to just hand the commissioner the the note of who I want to take. And that would be Onyeka Okongu. I don't think that there's any player that is a better fit than Okongwu to Charlotte. Charlotte needs to just go ahead and scrap the Cody Zeller experiment. It seems like he's been their center or you know, he's just been there, it seems like, since Al Jefferson. And he's not that old. I want to say that he was in the 2000, 
14 draft or maybe 13 draft. I'm not sure off the top of my head. But it's time for him to move on. And I think Okongwu is the perfect fit for Charlotte. He's a guy that I believe has a high ceiling. He's a guy that I can see coming in. And he provides an impact on the offensive glass. He is able to make an impact with his shot blocking. And he'll just be able to be that rim roller, vertical lob threat that comes in and you know is able to be a double double guy from start of his rookie year until you know the latter end of his prime. So he's a guy that I would select at number eight for Charlotte. He comes in right away, starts, and I think he's a guy that I could see being first team all rookie. With the ninth pick is the Washington Wizards, and it's a pretty simple pick for me. If I'm the general manager of the Washington Wizards, the position that I'm looking to address on draft night is point guard. Now, I know John Wall is supposed to be coming back, but you don't know if he's going to come back as the same player. So to me, it makes perfect sense to draft a a point guard who can possibly learn from John Wall for the next couple of years. And he can play, you know, in a small backcourt with Wall. He can play with Bradley Beal. And so the player that I would select, I think is the perfect piece for the Washington Wizards, is Cole Anthony. If you see my video on Anthony that I posted recently, I mentioned that he's a guy that I was pretty high on coming into the season. I kind of soured on him as the season went on. But as I watched this film again, I'm back on the, I guess, the, the bandwagon that I was on at the beginning of the season. And I think Cole is the ideal fit for Washington because he can learn from John Wall and also he can develop some point guard skills. I kind of question whether point guard is his long-term position, but I think that on a team like Washington, he can come in and be a six-man early in his career. He can focus on what he does best, but he can learn a little bit of the nuances and how to become a better playmaker and learn how to get guys involved. And I think John Wall is one of the best in the league that he can learn from. He can come in and spell wall as a backup point guard. I think he fits next to Bradley Bill. I like how he's able to shoot off the ball. He's good at catch and shoot situations and relocating. So I think that he could come in and provide Washington with some instant offense off the bench and still learn from two all-stars. Number 10. Number 10 is um, a pick that it, it seems like Phoenix really only has two choices here, in my opinion. Either you start grooming a point guard to learn from Ricky Rubio or you take a four. I think that, obviously, with Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton, the two and the five spots are going to be their cornerstone. So right now you're just looking to find pieces that fit along those guys. I think that Kelly Oubre is pretty much set as a – Solid player at the three. I think, you know, Mikael Bridges is a guy that is going to be a a high-end rotation player for them. So the position that I feel like could be an area of need is at the power forward spot. I know they have Dario Sarge there, but I think Obi Toppin is too good to pass up. There may be some questions about his defense, but I just think that at this late, getting a phenomenal offensive player like Toppin, a guy that is a high flyer, He can score in the post. I do believe that he is going to be able to extend his range and be a consistent floor spacer. I mean, he shot a pretty good percentage from three while he was in college. He just didn't have enough attempts. But I think Obi Toppin is a guy that could be a good fit for the Phoenix Suns. He kind of reminds me of a young Amari Stoudemire with the way he plays and the, you know, high flying act. And then, you know, his lack of defense could also remind you of Amari. But I think Obi Toppin at 10 is a great fit for the Phoenix Suns. Number 11. Number 11 with the San Antonio Spurs. This is a, this was a kind of a tough choice because, in my opinion, I believe San Antonio needs to just fully embrace a rebuild. Trade LaMarcus Aldridge. Um, get what you can get for Rudy Gay. Let DeMar DeRozan walk in free agency if he decides to opt in. And I'm not for sure if he can opt in or not, if he has a player option or a team option or whatever. But he's a guy that I would look to move. And if he's a free agent this year, I would let him walk. Because you can't convince me that Greg Popovich wants a team with LaMarcus Aldridge, 
DeMar DeRozan, and Rudy Gay, who are all guys that kind of rely on the mid-range game and all kind of like to shoot in the same spots. You just can't convince me that that is the type of offense that he wants to run. So you ask, well, which player fits in that system that's in this draft? And I'm having a difficult time trying to predict a player that fits in the system that I think Pop would like to run, but I think R.J. Hampton would be a good fit. And you ask, why R.J. Hampton? Well, R.J. kind of reminds me of Tony Parker. But hear me out. The reason I say he reminds me of Tony Parker is based off of his ability to get in the paint with straight line drives. Tony Parker wasn't a shifty, wiggle, dribble guy that just did a lot of stuff to get to his spots. He just beat you off straight line drives, quick first step, got the pick, got in the paint, and then once he got in the paint, he collapsed the defense. He was able to find the man in the corner who got the hockey assist, and the Spurs were just beating teams off ball movement, but a lot of it started off of Tony Parker's dribble penetration. I feel like RJ is a guy that will fit in the traditional Spurs system that I'm used to seeing them run, and I think that you give him a, a flat screen, he is going to get in the lane and collapse the defense, and he's a pretty good passer. If you had a chance to really watch his film, he does a good job of making skip passes that lead to hockey assists. So he's a guy that I believe will be a good fit in San Antonio, even though they have quite a few guards on the roster. I think they can move some of those guards for some other pieces, but R.J. Hampton to the Spurs is a pick that I would love to see. Number 12, Sacramento Kings. Sacramento is another team, and I know it sounds like I'm being redundant, another team that if you look at their roster, you can pretty much say that their core is set with Fox, Hield, uh, Marvin Bagley. I mean, they paid Harrison Barnes a lot of money, so I think that he's pretty much set to be in their rotation. So if I'm Sacramento, I'm gambling on the most talented player available. And in my opinion, the most talented player left is Jaden McDaniels from Washington. He's a guy that his talent and his production don't seem to match. You would think that he would have had a more productive freshman year at Washington, and for whatever reasons, he did not, but I love his talent. Well, you're not going to find many guys at his size that can do the things that he does. He's a pretty good ball handler. He has guard skills. He's, he's a little on the thin side, um, but he kind of reminds me of a poor man's Brandon Ingram. Not saying that he's as good as Brandon Ingram. I thought Ingram was a, a better shooter at the same stage in their career. If McDaniels can become similar to... Brandon Ingram, and there's a guy that you got in the late lottery, that's a win for the Kings. So he's in a situation where he doesn't have to come in and, and be a starter, and he likely wouldn't start, but he can come in, learn, earn his minutes, swing between possibly the two, three, and the four, and he can just grow and develop. So if I'm Sacramento, that's the gamble I'm taking on Jaden McDaniels. He may not be the safest pick, but I think that he has the highest upside of all the players that are available. 13. With the 13th pick, it's the New Orleans Pelicans. Again, same situation. We already know that Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson, those are going to be their two studs. Everyone else is going to have to fit around them. I think Lonzo Ball is a guy that you can bank on being part of their core in the near future. Same with Jackson Hayes. I'm not sure about Derek Favors, even though he's not as old as it seems. He seems like he's been in the NBA forever, but I guess it's because he was part of the Darren Williams to Brooklyn trade, which just seems like it was a long, long time ago. But anyway, I think that Tyrese Maxey would be a good fit here because you don't know what's going to happen with Drew Holiday. He's getting closer to the tail end of his prime. He may not want to be on a young team, even though I think the Pelicans are a team that can challenge for a playoff spot next season and possibly this season if um, you know the rest of the season goes on and teams are allowed to play the full schedule. But I think Maxi is a guy that can fit alongside Lonzo Ball because he's not really one, he's not really a two. He didn't really get a chance to showcase his point guard skills this season at Kentucky because they had quite a few other ball handlers. But I think that him and Lonzo could definitely play off of each other. Tyrese did not shoot the ball as well as I thought he would, but I'm still a believer in his his shot. For whatever reason, it just wasn't falling this year. He's a good defender. 
I think him and Lonzo would be a pretty good defending backcourt. Depending on what they do with J.J. Redick, Tyrese can come in as a six-man, but I definitely see him as a guy that could be a high-rotation player for them early in his career and then possibly be someone that can groom if Drew Holiday decides to, to move on or they decide to move him. So with the 13th pick, I would take... Tyrese Maxey from Kentucky if I'm the New Orleans Pelicans. To round out the lottery, it's the Portland Trailblazers. This pick is, is uh, I guess, kind of near and dear to me. I grew up as a Blazers fan, so you can probably see the Zach Randolph autograph, poster, or, or picture that I have in a frame. Portland is a team that I would have never guessed would be in the lottery this year, especially after going to the Western Conference Finals last year. But one of the things that I feel Portland has needed for the past few years is a four-man that can make plays for himself. Like, if you look at the series with the Pelicans, when they double-teamed Dame and then he passed the ball to CJ, they did not have another player that could dribble, pass, and shoot. And I know finding a big that can dribble, pass, and shoot is, you know, not easy not easy to find these days, but there's a guy that I think has the potential to be all of them on top of being a good defensive player, and that is Precious Achua. You know, I've had people tell me that I'm too high on him. They don't think that he's as good as where I have him ranked. And I definitely believe that he's raw, and I definitely know that it's going to take a team with a good developmental program in place. I know that he's a little old for his age group, but I like what he brings to the table. I think that he can be a good switchy defender. I think he can be a very good rebounder from the four spot. I think he has the ball handling skills to where he should be able to attack closeouts if he continues to develop as a shooter. And I see him as a guy that could be devastating in transition. So for Portland, I would take Precious Achua. I think that he has enough guard skills to have an advantage at the four. And I know that he'll come in, he'll rebound, he'll play hard, and he'll be on a team where he'll have to kind of play a role. He does have a tendency to play outside of himself and take some crazy shots. But I think with that team, and I, and I just feel like Portland has done a good job of developing players in the past, and I think that Precious Achua would be the pick that I would select if I'm the Portland Trailblazers. Another guy that I think would be a good fit for Portland would be Aaron Neesmith I'm from Vanderbilt. He is a phenomenal shooter. I think he would be a good complimentary player for Portland. I think Devin Vassell also could be a guy that Portland should look at at the 14th pick. But if I'm choosing, I'm going to swing for the fences on upside and fit, and I'm going to go with Precious Achua. 